You can all relax because my uh, contribution is not going to be, um, what's the word, as esoteric as uh, contributions that have been, that came before me. In fact, I feel a bit like after the Lord Mayor's show, the dust cart. So this is a kind of much more relaxed and less cerebral view of uh, this whole area. Okay, psychedelics, promotion versus discretion, the conundrum. Um, I hope you'll find what I have to say of some interest. I have um, personally a kind of, having taken lots of acid, I nonetheless have a very neutral, or take a neutral position when it comes to condoning or condemning the consumption of acid. I do neither. I consider myself a libertarian. What people want to put in their bodies frankly, is their business, and I, I try not to get involved in it. So I come from that position. But um, I'd like to start off with presenting a kind of historical overview from the 60s of what occurred prior to and after October the 6th, 1966, when LSD was made illegal in the United States. I've got to ask whoever it is who's talking over there to go and do somewhere else because I can hear this conversation in this ear while I'm trying to say this. It's a bit difficult because I've got stereo hearing. Anyway, in 1966, possession and recreational use of acid was criminalised. Legal scientific research programmes were shut down in the US and similar laws followed throughout the rest of the world. Theoretically, that, I guess, should have been the end of the story but we know now, 45 years later, that that's not the case. And the acid, albeit of somewhat dubious provenance, is still widely available. In my opinion, the draconian overreaction by the governments of the world to the phenomena of psychedelic drugs can largely be blamed upon the activities of one man, namely Timothy Leary. And I'd like to quote for you what Owsley, Bear Stanley, had to say about Leary. Quote, Leary was a fool. Drunk with celebrity hood and his own ego, he became a media clown and was arguably the, single, the sing, arguably the single most damaging actor involved in the destruction of the evanescent social movement of the 60s. Tim, with his very public exhortations to the kids to tune in, turn on and drop out, is the inspiration for all the current draconian US and European drug laws against psychedelics. He would not listen to any of us when we asked him to please call it. He loved the limite and relished his notoriety. I was not a fan of his. End of quote. I was not a fan of his either, but allow me to continue. Leary's wild ride on a psychedelic gravy train of his own invention is well known to the cognoscenti, but I'd like to highlight certain salient features of what, with the benefit of hindsight, seems like a willfully self-destructive chosen path. He was arrested in total 29 times and had the dubious distinction of being called by President Nixon the da most dangerous man in America. In a few short years, he went from being a professor at Harvard to a man on the run, consulting with the Black Panthers in Algiers and with the Weather Underground who facilitated his escape from prison. Between these two extremes, he ran against Ronald Reagan for governor of California with the campaign slogan, come together, join the party. And of course, in 1969, Lennon wrote a campaign song for him, which was actually a great tune called Come Together. To my mind, Leary personified a certain kind of personality type who seems unable to synthesize their own spiritual experiences, for want of another term, other than by proselytizing them from the rooftops. I met him several times and on each occasion he kind of reminded me of a Jesus freak, so absolutely convinced by his own salvation that he was determined to save everyone else around him by spreading the news. Frankly, what with Leary being a psychologist, I was always amazed that the man couldn't see for himself how irrational and unstable his own behaviour was. As the former true manager of the Grateful Dead, I've had to deal with many Leary personality types. Most of them with strange gleams in their eye would appear at the dressing room door with fervent pleas to see Jerry Garcia so that they could impart some astronomically important piece of information that only they possessed and which, and which it was vital that they gave to Garcia. 
We rather unkindly referred to these people as casualties, but that was, to put it bluntly, frequently what they were. Nonetheless, we had to deal with them. Uh, sorry, nonetheless, we had to deal with them, and a million different strategies emerged dependent upon each individual circumstance with which we were confronted. Here's a short tale of such a situation. I should warn you, you'll probably find this a bit brutal, having uh, following on uh, the people who previously talked about various strategies for dealing with people who are having bad trips. <laughs> <coughs> But this is the way it was. We, we tell nothing but the truth up here. The Grateful Dead were playing a concert in Seattle, Washington in the United States. 10,000 people having a ball and as a tour manager, I was involved with many different cases of uh, overstimulation or drug overdoses on the night. A young man with long hair lay on the floor in front of the stage and he was naked and screaming, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die. He was surrounded by 10 or so Seattle riot policemen dressed in full combat gear with nightsticks drawn. The, the cops were totally confused and stood in a circle looking down at this distressed man, not knowing whether to arrest him, beat him or simply ignore him. It was a tense and volatile situation and I sensed that very quickly someone would be feeling the full weight of the law and getting seriously hurt or dragged off to jail or both. I was still wondering how to save the luckless fellow lying on the floor, remembering that I too was on acid, when one of the Grateful Dead's crew managed to slip through the policeman's legs and grabbing the screaming man's head in his hands, he whispered in his ears. The screaming and freaking out immediately stopped. The man seemed Im immediately pacified, much to my astonishment and that of the police, who seemed what, somewhat relieved that they wouldn't have to be dealing with the madman. I grabbed the guy's clothes and managed to reassure the cops that he was now okay, and they somewhat miraculously departed. With the crisis over, I returned to the backstage area and asked the crew member, who once been one of the original pranksters on the bus with Kesey, what it was that he had said to the naked man. With a wicked grin, he replied, die, motherfucker, die. <laughs> And with those few words, the man was saved from an ancient inner demon and reborn. <laughs> As my mother used to say, there are many ways of skinning a cat. Anyway, back to Leary. Leary babbled like a man possessed about the benefits of acid and by so doing stimulated the media in the USA to such an extent the newspapers were full of outrageous story, which mainly sought to portray Acid is leading to rampant pros promiscuity, free love, and the collapse of all societal norms. Misinformation became disinformation as government agencies fran frantically sought to dissuade American youth from being tempted by the drug. An hysterical overreaction on the part of the churches and the American political classes of all types ensued, being America, in true American style, as the LSD cat was out of the bag and there was no putting it back in. In my opinion, Leary's one-man crusade was to have devastating effects from which many peaceful proponents of the drugs consumption were to suffer. And I would add, although I haven't got it written down here, I think that we are only now, 40 odd years later, emerging from a period of relative darkness that was a result of Leary's approach. So Leary, I only use Leary as one example of one approach. I'd like to now present a different example of how perhaps to approach it. Opposing Leary from what could be called the discreet side of the street were people centred around the Grateful Dead and the San Francisco scene. These people had experienced firsthand the media's attention which had brought chaos to the very delicate scene of the Haight-Ashbury by encouraging thousands of kids to descend upon San Francisco. Lurie tells in the newspapers about hippies and what was happening in Frisco had destroyed the scene virtually overnight and a death of hippie mock funeral was quickly arranged to signal to one and all the end. Within 18 months of the summer of love, most of the original people that had been involved had fled to the countryside and left the city. No one in the wider Grateful Dead family believed that anything other than total discretion was the order of the day. Subsequent persecutions by the legal authorities confirmed them in their apprehension that those who put their heads above the parapets and publicly promulgated the wider use of acid ran the risk of some sort of arbitrary 
annihilation or at the very least state-sponsored incarceration. The Grateful Dead aren't very well known in Australia, though they're a massive phenomenon in America. But it's well known to those who are aware of the history of popular culture, at least in the United States. But the Deborah and Acid-based jam band who played at the original Acid Test and have been directly associated with Keezy and the Pranksters. The lyrics of their songs dripped in psychedelic symbolism, which whilst it might have been obscured to the general populace, was nonetheless crystal queer, excuse me, crystal clear to those who had eyes to see. Their message, such as it was, was couched in poetic metaphors and artistic subtleties, which in a sense protected the band from overt persecution. One thing was for, the sh was, one thing was for sure about the Grateful Dead and their family, they had absolutely no intention of becoming victims of state or federal persecution. And if only as a means of self-preservation, they trod a subtle and distinctive path of discretion rather than shouting any kind of direct endorsement of the benefits of psychedelics. As a consequence of their insight and skill at deflecting those who might wish them harm, the band and family made music for decades without having their personal consumption of acid ever represent any kind of a problem. At the same time, they produced lyrics of luminous beauty, which their fans understood as veiled references to mysteries beyond the ken of most people. A famous line which says it all. Lady finger dripped in moonlight, riding what for across the morning sky. I've chosen Leary and the Dead as two widely different examples of the choices which I think confront us all today and which have confronted many of us throughout our lives. As human beings alive at this time, we are the guardians of the search for ancient truths, which man has always been drawn to and fascinated to explore since the time of Greek civilization and way back indeed to pre-recorded history. Those of an elevated consciousness who inhabit this planet know that the majority of the human race lives in an occluded form of ignorance, unable to develop for themselves a path to virtually any form of higher reasoning. We, cert we observe our fellow human beings with love and compassion and naturally we wish to help them unlock some of the mysteries which you be, we have been fortunate enough to employ, thereby, to a greater or lesser extent, freeing ourselves from the dreary reality of consumerism. But therein lies the rub. In my personal opinion, each and every one of us would do well to examine our own psychedelic experiences and to seriously consider whether our insights are actually communicable and upon what basis. Many of the luminosities of a trip are not amenable to direct communication. We've all been in the strange position of listening to someone trying to share what it is they experience, while not quite feeling able to actually really understand what it was they went through, even though we have made similar inner journeys ourselves. I'm reminded of Wittgenstein's modern observation, whereof we cannot speak, we must remain silent. What is it that we can tell people about psychedelics? What indeed can we tell people about consciousness? I'd like to proffer some suggestions, but they are made with the specific caveat that I am by no means an expert in this field. I am simply, like everyone else here, a pilgrim on the path, intent on developing to the best of my abilities that which I possess. I'm also very much concerned that whatever I might say to those who seek transcendental truth, it should, should not be harmful to them, or as it were, lead them astray. Everybody with me? I'm trying to, I'm really, I'm not really trying to tell you anything in so far as I know something you don't know. I'm trying to really attempt to share something here, which is how we talk to people about this experience, the experience of psychedelics, or choose not to talk to them about it. Anyway, keep going, Sam. <laughs> It strikes me when we talk with the uninitiated that a good place to begin any conversation about psychedelics should be entitled The Uses and Abuses of Consciousness. A mind is a terrible thing to waste and in contemporary society one, one doesn't have to be a genius to note that kids all over the world are literally getting wasted. They take drugs as a method of escape from the humdrum realities of daily life. They take drugs for essentially hedonistic purposes. People in modern parlance want to get out of it. They want to transport their minds to some place other than here. If I can be crude, for I know of no other way to describe what the kids are doing, and I've had it described many times to me this way by the kids themselves, they want to get fucked up. 
Very few people are taking drugs, in my experience, because they think there are any long-term benefits of insight involved. Most of them are simply consuming drugs for other reasons other than the be those you know, benefits. I've talked over the years to hundreds of young people about the reasons for taking drugs, if not thousands, and I can count on my finger the numbers who told me that they initially took psychedelics because they thought that by so doing, they could access higher forms of consciousness that might be of long-term benefit either to themselves or to their fellow human beings. So I always try and begin with kids talking about the difference between being fucked up and being high, to use phrases which they commonly employ. To disorder the mind as an end in and of itself is to me a nihilistic abuse of drugs, yet this is widely practiced. This is what kids do, be it with alcohol, MDMA or other drugs, and it's something I find personally distasteful. I tried to de-romanticize the topic by talk, talking of the use of psychedelics as a tool, to, very much like Bear used to talk about it, to be employed in some further purpose and not as an end in itself. What might this purpose be? How could one actually describe such a things? Kids today, by which I mean young adults, are searching for answers to perennial questions that have been around for thousands of years. Who am I? Why am I alive? What am I supposed to be doing with my life, for example? Every teenager of moderate intelligence that has ever lived has asked themselves these questions at one time or another. It should also be made clear that many teenagers do not want to confront these questions and use drugs as a means to avoid facing them. The church and philosophers for hundreds of years have been the repository of most of the answers which have been available to young people, but now there's been a sea change. Should, be, should people be asking themselves the perennial questions, then they want to discover the answers for themselves. Uh, they don't want to de them delivered by mum, dad, the church, the state, or anyone outside of themselves. So fearlessly, and sometimes with catastrophic results, they embark upon inner journeys to unknown destination, taking drugs whose effects they can be completely unaware of, drugs of which they have little or no understanding. They certainly do not know how, to, how pure the drugs they might consume, sorry, they certainly do not know how pure the drugs they consume might be, and they seem more than willing to put their lives at risk by scoring their drugs from unscrupulous criminal syndicates that ultimately couldn't give a damn about their welfare. In the, same, in the name of the so-called war on drugs, effectively, we've delivered our children to the mass market in blandishments of narco crooks and criminals, with often catastrophic results. And yet, interestingly, these gangs of profiteers have by and large steered clear of the psychedelics. This might well be because in their very manufacture, it's imp virtually impossible for the chemists not to be affected by the substance he's creating. Personally, I'm not, a wide, I'm not a proponent of the widespread use of psychedelics. I don't think by any stretch that they're suitable for one and all. I don't encourage people to take them, and I don't discourage people. I've never had anything to do with their manufacture or distribution, though I've met people in the course of my life who've been intimately concerned with the attempt to turn on the world. Should someone wish to embark upon the spiritual journey, for one of another phrase, then we, have, then we who have experience of the path should report to them, in my opinion, with discretion and some reservations about the nature of the experience. In the years since the 60s, the attitude of Western societies to the vexed issue of drug consumption have changed, though the problems seem as intractable as ever. Millions have been imprisoned and fined, and many have had their lives badly affected by their choices, while others have benefited from the experience and gone on to live productive and meaningful lives as, contribu as contributing members of the society to which they belong. A new paradigm has now finally emerged, whereby the psychedelics are now seen as possibly beneficial rather than irrevocably harmful. This has led, finally, to the opportunity for rational debate and research about these matters. And I welcome the efforts put in here at this conference and at other gatherings around the world to address these topics within the framework of calm and dignified discourse. The somewhat hysterical and over-the-top proselytizing of the Tim Timothy Learys of this world set back the process of understanding and synthesizing the psychedelic experience by a generation. And we would all of us do well to learn by those mistakes. My small contribution here has been to make has been sorry. My small contribution here has been made to suggest in short the following. 
we should always exercise caution when mentoring the uninitiated. That we should constantly remember there is a price to be paid for the acquisition of any knowledge. That substances which can change the inner gestalt of a person's experience should always be treated with reverence, care and the utmost respect. The liberation of consciousness from the daily minute of existence is a choice that each and every one of us is free to choose or not as we will. Governments may come and go, people will live, people will die. The search for meaning by human beings will continue as long as the human race survives. I'd like to read a short passage from a book published in 1964 and co-authored co by Leary, Richard Alpert and Ralph Metzer. It was called The Psychedelic Experience. In it they wrote, and I quote, a psychedelic experience is a journey to new realms of consciousness. The scope and content of the experience is limitless, but its characteristic features are the transcendence of verbal concepts, of space-time dimensions, and of the ego, or identity. Such experiences of enlarged consciousness can, exert, can occur in a variety of ways. Sensory deprivation, yoga exercise, discipline meditation, religious or aesthetic ecstasies, or spontaneously. Most recently, they have become available to anyone through the ingestion of psychedelic drugs such as LSD, psilocybin, mescaline, DMT, etc. Of course, the drug does not produce the transcendent experience, it merely acts as a chemical key. It opens the mind, frees the nervous system of its ordinary patterns and structures. End of quote. I personally would have said they'd have done well to have added a caveat to that particular uh, paragraph that, say, that said, handle with extreme care. So what I've tried to do here is summarize the two kind of opposing schools that have brought us to the here and now, one of which proselytized the benefits and, and far outness, etc., of the psychedelics, and the other one of which was um, very much more discreet. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt that the people who initially wild, were wildly enthusiastic and public about LSD caused a lot of heat to occur, which people of my age in their late 60s have had to kind of endure over the years. Uh, and perhaps the situation has changed somewhat, I'm not sure. I hope my comments have, will produce a bit of a response. I, I'm as interested to hear what you've got to say as a as I am in standing up here spouting off to you, but I've sought to pose the problem and illustrate it rather than to proffer specific solutions. Thanks for the courtesy of inviting me to speak here. I've had a wonderful day to listening to other people and meeting people and talking to people. And thanks for not pelting me with tomatoes, which is actually what happened to Tim Leary when he addressed a crowd of, at a pop festival in America in the 80s. And uh, hopefully we've all moved on a bit since then. Um, yeah, I invite you to uh, say some things about whether we should be discreet or whether we should be uh, shouting from the rooftops about these things. Thanks very much. None? Shoot, not literally. Uh, bang. Hi. <laughs> G'day. Um, yeah, it's not a question, just a comment, really. Um, yeah. I totally agree that proselytizing and, um, and unscrupulous promotion can be definitely damaging to our cause, but at the same time, I think that without acknowledging what we do, we can never move forward and we can't. We can't rely too heavily on discretion either, and I think we need to strike a balance. I just wondered if I could get your thoughts on that. Well, I mean, yeah, by and large, I, I mean, I agree. You know, how could one not agree with what you're saying? I mean, it, I mean, what you've just said applies to everything, man. You know, really, in in this world, I mean, it's what Buddhists may describe as the middle way. The the at, at the extremes. Uh, of uh, of either you know wishing you know kind of like Jesus freaks 
to communicate the experience and share, you know, that, that kind of manic over compensating that, that extreme compared to the completely private extreme, those two are probably equally, you know, d if damaging is the right word, I don't know. But yeah, I mean, each of us, I think, has to make a, uh, a, a choice, you know, where we kind of position ourselves. But I, I do have slight misgivings, if I can characterize it as that, about the collective psychedelic experience. Um, I've seen, you know, concerts with the Grateful Dead playing and 60,000 people uh, tripping off their tits and having a fucking great time. It's been incredible. Uh, at the, in the, within that environment. Thereafter, people go their own merry way and I don't know how much of a community, as it were, you know, that that represents. I think it's such a such an individual experience that I, I, I wonder about the, the community aspect of it. But that's just me. Thank you. We have a question over here. Hi, Sam. Um, Hi. I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on the problems you see that Timothy Leary caused with his ethos and the results, the resulting negative implications over the intervening well, years since yeah. the damage that he caused. Yeah, I mean, we always used to say, don't frighten the straights, you know. They're frightened enough as it is, so don't, you know, don't upset the police, don't make them really scared, you know what I mean? Don't persuade everyone it's all a giggle and a laugh and it's okay, you know, kind of like Keezy used to do. Okay, we are a bit strange, but we don't represent any kind of a threat, don't worry. And not to make free people feel afraid. Um, but within the Grateful Dead, ACID was seen, thanks to Owsley, very much as a kind of a tool. It wasn't something that people sat around and took and, and then kind of lounged about. We took it within the, within the uh, conceptual framework of making music, of building stages and putting up sound systems and traveling to other cities and the whole thing of being on the road. So it was part and parcel of a kind of, if you like, a mission that we were on, which was, you know, doing 100 gigs a year. And so it was, it was never allowed to kind of interfere with that, and it was always part of that, um, that framework. Uh, I think that Leary's, the big, my biggest, and the Grateful Dead's biggest problem, quote, quote, with uh, Leary was the fact that Acid was presented in far too um, kind of apocalyptic terms for straight America's consumption. And basically what it did was brought on a lot of heat, um, which we didn't want, we didn't approve of. And it also just generated masses of misinformed public uh, comments in, in the press that, again, justified lots of heat. So we just saw it at that time as, as something of a negative. Does that answer? Or, yeah, does that answer you? Yeah. We just couldn't see any point in, in doing stuff that brought, I mean, this is really what it comes down to, is we, we couldn't see at that time in history, we couldn't see any reason, beneficial reason in doing stuff that brought heat on people. It just seemed a dumb thing to do. Um, thanks for the discussion. I think it's a really interesting problem, the paradoxy, you know, the, the interplay between discretion and disclosure. And I definitely think that shameless promotion might be not such a good thing, but in this age of so much technology, iPhones and Facebook and webcams and so much surveillance, do you think that the age of real discretion is impossible now? Um, well, we, we're in a kind of funny period, aren't we? Because we're in this period where grandparents are getting stoned with their grandchildren, which certainly didn't happen when I was a kid, you know what I mean? It's like, you know, fathers, like I'm a father of teenage kids. I mean, neither of my kids get high. They have very firm uh, 
opinions about it, mainly because of their father, no doubt. But we don't want to be like you. Fuck. Um, but uh, we, do, we do have this strange situation, you know, and very, to my mind, very beautiful situation where kids and, and, and parents or grandparents can get high together, which is, in a sense, is completely unique, you know. Um, so I think there is a role, I think there's a role for kind of nurturing and mentoring on a kind of gentle level. Um, when people are genuinely seeking for some, you know, assistance. I, I'm, I'm very concerned that by communicating with other people your own, own experience of psychedelics, what you t can tend to do is paint their picture, which they've yet to experience. You can kind of preform their picture, if you like, that they're either aiming for or going to experience. And I rather, it's a bit like, you know, so teaching somebody to paint and saying, well, this is how you should paint. This is what it should look like. Uh, you know, I don't really agree with that. And so I, I'd much rather that people actually made their own discoveries and I think that each generation in turn will have to make their own discoveries and hopefully, anyway, they don't listen to the previous generation very much anyway, but if, you know, hopefully we're just there to hold someone's hand if they really need it rather than being a directing force, you know. I guess I meant more on a political sphere that with all the technology that's everywhere, it's really hard to, to be discreet in our actions, that it's hard to hide what we do, and that now, as far as politically concerned, we don't even need Leary because all of us document way too well what we're doing. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, is that, of course, during the time of Leary, you know, in the 60s and 70s, it was very much a minority of people that were involved in these areas. Now, it's everywhere. You know, it's not as if it's possible for them to really isolate people who've had psychedelic experiences. Those people are all over the planet. So, I, you know what I mean? I don't think it's that easy necessarily for them to particularly persecute people anymore. But I still think there's a kind of moral, if that's the word, moral imperative involved that one should be very careful about encouraging people, not because I, I think, you know, the experience is damaging to them, I just mean in terms of, by encouraging people and describing your own experiences, you can, as I said before, you can somehow modify other people's experiences. And I would rather that they arrived kind of with a clean slate and got to ride on it themselves rather than that we did it for them. We've got a question over the other side, over here. Yeah, um, look, I guess everybody's asking this question, but um, look, from an artist's perspective, uh, I'm working on a CD at the moment, which <laughs> I'd like to intrigue people about uh, psychedelics and you know, potentially uh, facilitate, you know, people, people getting switched on themselves. Um, but um, it, it was good to have your warning tonight about being too, you know, too, too preachy or whatever. What, what kind of um, advice would you offer to an artist to, to tread that line? God knows. Um, let's have a thing. Um, I mean, I've worked with lots of people who were, you know, I guess you would describe them as psychedelic artists. They certainly took lots of acid and they wrote about the acid experience. But they did it um, obliquely. They didn't do it directly. They did it using metaphor and poetry. And, I, I, you know, I think it's incumbent upon artists, if artists are, for example, you know, going to confront the issue or, or embrace the issue of psychedelics, then it's important that their, their take should be um, a kind of a affirmative take in the sense that I think it should be, you know, kind of life enhancing, uh, experience enhancing. 
and that it should be suitably poetic and, and far out. Um, and not, as you say, not preachy. But other than that, who knows, man? All kinds of bands over the years have done all kinds of wonderful psychedelic music. So there's, there's you know, as my mum used to say, there's lots of ways of skinning a cat. Each person, it's such a subjective thing. Each person has a, their own take on, if you like, the psychedelic experience, which again, is one of the reasons why I'm, I have my, reservations about the communication of the psychedelic experience. Um, I think that it's so personal that sometimes it's virtually impossible to communicate it to other people. It doesn't mean that, that having a go at it's probably quite fun, but I don't know how valuable it is. Do we have any more questions? Or points, points. really, I mean, Talking to me is the same as talking to you. I'm not. I'm, I'm really interested in the point between proselytizing and inspiring people. I mean, do you draw a personal line, or is it something that we all individually have to draw? I don't. I mean, I don't really believe in inspiring people. I think all the. <laughs> you made all this wonderful music. And well, I didn't. I helped the people do it, but I personally didn't play the guitars. I mean, no, I um. You know, I think that it's a bit like Buddhism, man. You know, people ask you, ask me about Buddhism. I always say to them, look, listen, there's so much information out there, man. It, you know, the desire to find out about it is laudable. Now go and do it. I, you know, I don't think that the way to find out about psychedelics is to talk to people who've taken psychedelics. The way to find out about psychedelics is to take them. Do you think that that's not necessarily a hard minimal, minimalizationist approach? That, that people could be damaged by not receiving information? I, mean, what I think people can be damaged by listening to information, actually. I mean, I've heard a lot of misinformation over the years given to people about acid, you know, and, and about other drugs. So, you know, it's a kind of damned if you do and damned if you don't situation that you, you won't confine oneself. And just broadly speaking, I think that people are quite capable of finding out for themselves. If there's anything that one can communicate to people, it's basically just physical shit. Like, well, look, listen, if you want to talk to God, you need to take, you know, 300 micrograms. And if you want to count the money and deal with the police, you need to take 40. You know, so, you know, other than that, I, I've always, um, I've dealt with lots of uh, people who've uh, had very bad trips, you know, and that I, I can't suggest to people that there's one way particularly of doing it. Uh, I used to watch people being injected with Thorazine, which was a kind of treatment for bad trips way back in the 60s and 70s. And I always wondered what that was like. So one time at a Grateful Dead gig, I was pretty high and I decided well, I'll go and get a shot of Thorazine to see what it did to you. <laughs> Fuck, it was a total bummer, man. It was unbelievable. But then I discovered that if you, somebody's on a bad trip, all you need to do is get, often, not always, but often, is just give them a Mars bar. You know that? Somebody's having a bad trip, give them a Mars bar. You'd be amazed what happens. Yeah, it's something to do with glucose. A, a biochemist could tell you what the, I don't know about the chemical reaction, but I know it works. Blood sugar and chocolate. Blood sugar, chocolate, yes, yeah, stuff, stuff like that. So, I can't pretend I'm an expert on these things, but of course, you know, being a tour manager, one deals with, if you're a tour manager of a band where everybody's taking acid, you deal with a lot of issues that arise. What was your traditional um, method for dealing with the proselytizers? Well, people used to come to the door of the Grateful Dead's uh, dressing room and, you know, be one of the equipment guys would stop them and they'd go, oh, I've got to talk to Garcia, you know, I've, I've discovered the secret of the universe or whatever. Then the equipment guy would come and see me because he didn't want to fucking deal with it. Hey, man, there's a guy at the door who wants to talk to Jerry, you deal with it. Okay, so I used to go out and the guys, I've got to talk to Garcia. I said, well, I'm his fucking tour manager. I've got to talk to him too, man. I don't know where he is or whatever. So, you know, you just uh, you know, do what you can to, uh, to you know, divert people. Uh, there's a lot of casualties in this world. Does anyone have any more questions? 
Hello, Hello, Sam. Thank you very much indeed. Hello. Yeah, that was a very nice talk, and uh, yeah, in full support of everything you're saying. I think if you whitewash anything, people can lose respect for it. So we keep respect intact. We should be okay. But would you mind telling us uh, another story or two involving Garcia, or is that getting off the topic? No, I mean Garcia used to get high, you know. For all, well, I worked with him for nearly five years. He got high every time he played. But we always, we, what we, okay, this is what happened in those days. We had, Marine is a, is a, 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 a solution that people put in their eyes to kind of, if they get grit or something in your eye, you know, or your eyes feel tired, whatever. It's kind of sterile solution. And we used to put acid in, marine bottles because they started off being sour so if you did a drop one drop from a bottle which you could do you could actually squeeze it and make one drop that was about 40 micrograms so that's what people used to take which is a kind of little tweak you know of the of your consciousness really but it allowed you to count money or deal with the cops or promoters or play music or whatever and some people you know if you felt like you wanted more some people wanted more so nonetheless that was it was not something that was uh, publicly broadcast J Garcia played with the you know the, the original acid test he played with the pranksters and then thereafter they decided that they would rather keep these things to themselves so that's what they did and I I kind of went along with that. I always, I always felt comfortable with that. And uh, of course, you know, being an, an acid band, Jerry had to deal with a lot of the people who felt that they'd, you know, received amazing kind of cosmically significant messages from who knows where. And he was very patient about it. I think he just felt it was part of the karma, you know, to have to deal with those people. So often I would tell people, there's no way you can talk to Garcia. He don't want to talk to you, you know what I mean? He's got too many things to do. And Jerry would come out and go, no, 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 I'll talk to him. And was very patient and very caring and loving where I was probably a bit, you know, short and, um, and preoccupied. He was a very caring guy and, um, yeah, very, very concerned about people. So I, I I, I admired him uh, for that. He was, he was a lovely guy, and it was a tragedy uh, what happened to him, really. Um, he died very young for a uh, human being, you know. He wasn't 60, so to, in my book, he was pretty young. There we go. He, you know, there's a price to be paid for being a world-famous guitar player and doing 100 gigs a year for year in, year out, year in, year out. He kind of exhausted himself. The Grateful Dead just brought out the largest, I don't think anybody knows this in Australia, except for demented Grateful Dead freaks. Um, they just brought out the largest release of any rock and roll band in the history of the music business. They brought a 70 CD set, 70 no less. Yeah, of a tour we did in 1972 in Europe, a European tour. And it sold 7,500 copies of this set in a week. You know, so it's pretty extraordinary. So they're still amazingly popular in the United States. And um, so their influence continues. And uh, it is very much an acid-based influence, but it's managed to be that without, very cleverly, without ever kind of announcing it, you know, in a press release or a headline but at the same time with everybody n yet knowing it. It's very clever and uh, that allowed them to play for 40 years together without ever being busted once. Well, they were busted once, but that was early in their uh, career and I took care of that with a, a large amount of money. <laughs> Good old America. Well, thanks for having me. I must say, this is a, just an absolutely lovely scene here. I've been to hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, rock and roll festivals and outdoor events. So lovely just to be able to walk around and actually see the grass and have time to chat to other people. And I encourage uh, the EGA to keep the numbers 
at this kind of level, regardless of demand, because it allows, I think, for a, a unique experience that you don't get when there's, you know, 5,000 or even 3,000 people. I, I would estimate, I guess, there's five or 600 people here in this beautiful site, and that strikes me as just being the perfect number. So, small is beautiful, and thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir.